I really was happy to accept the privilege of coming here to share a few words with you about a person that you all have long ago uh, recognized for his remarkable leadership and even more so uh, have committed to help uh, uh, support this uh, terrific idea of the Brent Scowcroft Center uh, on International Security within the walls of the Atlantic Council. And given Brent's extraordinary journey uh, with so many presidents, with so many different administrations in such a bipartisan way, and the remarkable counsel that he has offered uh, in all of that period, I can't think of anything more appropriate, though he obviously, we all know, uh, will probably never acknowledge that it's even named after him. Uh, but uh, uh, it's very, very special to be able to find somebody in today's world who represents this kind of standard of public service and of bipartisanship. I, I sat in my chair wistfully listening to Fred uh, talk about Henry Cabot Lodge and Dean Rusk and these other folks uh, and Brent, uh, Republicans, who uh, you know, made me sit there and salivate for that kind of presence and partnership today, uh, which we just, honestly, we just don't have, and, and it's very unfortunate. Um, and we have to try to find our way forward, notwithstanding that. But Brent, I think what you're celebrating is not just the fact of, of his journey and the way in which he has served so many presidents in such critical periods. But I think you're celebrating uh, a methodology, uh, a way of behaving, uh, a stature, and a kind of uh, uh, presence, if you will, on the scene that speaks to the needs of this moment that calls on all of us to try to find uh, a way to listen to each other more effectively uh, and a way to talk across party lines and find not the ideological barrier that's so easy to set up to stop something from happening, but rather to find the commonality of interest that allows us to get something done, not, not, not to gridlock it, but rather achieve something great for our nation. Uh, and that is always how I have seen this man act. Uh, when I was uh, uh, working on the normalization of relationship with Vietnam, uh, we just would never have made progress if President George Herbert Walker Bush and Brent Scowcroft at his side and General Vesey at their side hadn't all decided this was an issue in our national interest. There were plenty of ways to have hidden behind the political landmines that lay in that path, believe me. But Brent uh, never saw those. He only saw the interest strategically of our literally ending a war that in its own way was still going on in our country. And I like to think that together we actually ultimately made peace in that part of the world. And as a result have created a buffer uh, to China's interests and a presence uh, in commerce as well as in emerging values, not yet obviously where they need to be in many ways, but emerging that has now seen who would have thought of this, Harlan, who would have thought that American ships would be returning for visits, one with the name of McCain on them, to Camran Bay. That's where we are uh, as a result of the kinds of efforts that culminated with a President Clinton who had every reason also to duck it, for all the obvious reasons, uh, but who braved the potential storm and saw it through and actually normalized the relations and then visited Vietnam as a sitting President of the United States in the year 2000. Those journeys are the kinds of things that I think you're honoring in creating this center. Uh, Brent has uh, you know, we invited him to come and testify on uh, START Treaty. And in characteristic humility, 
Brent opened his testimony saying, you know, I'm really not an expert on arms control at all. <laughs> and then he proceeded to talk about how he'd been involved in every agreement from SALT 1 to START 2. Uh, putting the lie to his own humility, but nevertheless doing so in a way that was so graceful and so appropriate. Um, I have to also call to everybody's mind the fact that this is a man who has specialized in tectonic plate historic transitions. Uh, the fall of the Soviet Empire, something we wanted and worked for and espoused for 30, 40 years, but which came with such suddenness that it needed skilled management. And again, uh, Brent uh, in his role as security advisor and president provided that management uh, and, and the SEED Act uh, uh, is a classic example of the way in which they saw the economic potential, they saw the need to provide jobs and stability, and they immediately engaged in a way that created a peaceful transition where there could have been who knows what. And today we have democracies. Today we have members of NATO. Today we have uh, countries that are contributing not only to the march of democracies, but the march of the marketplace. And I think uh, uh, he presided over the reunification of Germany, provided over the denuclearization of former Soviet states, and provided, presided over uh, this extraordinary transition. So we have a lot to learn from that kind of stewardship of our diplomatic interests. And I just say very quickly, that the reason this is so important is that we are now engaged in three of the most significant transitions that we could have imagined, uh, and, and their outcome is still very much in question. Uh, the first transition, obviously, is the one out of two wars, Iraq and Afghanistan. And both will require enormous uh, calibration and sensitivity to uh, the need to honor the sacrifice made by so many soldiers, uh, to honor the strategic interests that are at risk in those places, but at the same time to recognize the limits of our ability to fully determine that outcome and therefore the need to build a very significant uh, coalition of interested parties, uh, ranging from all of the stands uh, to uh, the near neighbors, uh, Pakistan, with all of its complications, and India, and the complications of the India-Pakistan relationship, and of course, uh, even Iran. And I happen to believe that uh, there are real possibilities with respect to Iran, notwithstanding the very difficult place we find ourselves in today. And I think it's imperative that we pursue uh, thoughtfully what those uh, may be uh, to avoid what could be uh, extraordinarily uh, dangerous uh, uh, moment uh, in the near months here, and we need to be clear about that. So that is one transition, and whether or not and how we manage the Afghanistan peace could determine whether Afghanistan is in fact a place of stability and of importance to the region uh, and to its neighbors, or whether there will be a war, even in our absence. Second transition is the one with respect to China and uh, the Far East, and uh, that is why the President has put troops in Darwin, that is why uh, we have the Trans-Pacific uh, Trade Agreement, that is why he was at the East Asian Summit, that is why Secretary Clinton has written about and we have articulated a, a shift in some focus, not away from Europe, but really there uh, in addition to. And one thing I want to say to everybody, and I feel this particularly as Chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee, a lot of countries are wondering whether we're going to back off or whether the United States is going to diminish its role. Uh, I am convinced that we will not and should not and do not have to, and that we will get through this economic transitional moment for ourselves. But that the 1% or less that we put into our foreign interests is a pittance compared to what we ought to be putting into it and to what we need to balance in terms of any of the interests of our budget measured against health care, other things that we can do a much better job on. 
So our foreign interests do not need to pay the price of our current fiscal dilemma. And I intend to make that argument as powerfully as I can over the course of these next uh, months, uh, that it is even more imperative, given the nature of globalization and the competitive marketplace we're operating in, that we be engaged and we continue to play the role we have played. Uh, and I think the Atlantic Council can play a critical role in helping us to achieve that. The final transition uh, is, uh, is the uh, stunning transformation, yet undefined fully, that is taking place in the Middle East. Uh, the greatest upheaval since the fall of the Ottoman Empire. And so we obviously uh, are working our way through that, and, and it will provide us with a challenging confrontation between values and interests, which is what makes up foreign policy. Uh, sometimes your interests will supersede your values, and sometimes your values will supersede your interests. And sometimes you have the permission to do one or the other. Uh, I think that uh, we've learned some lessons in these past years. I certainly there was a rush to have an election in the West Bank, which both Israel and the Palestinians were telling us we should not rush to have. And we insisted on it. And when the outcome was contrary to our uh, presumptions and or wishes, uh, we walked away from it. Uh, not a great approach, folks, to uh, any aspect of how we ought to be dealing with that part of the world. Uh, and in Egypt, uh, the people made their choice before we added our voices. Uh, but it obviously had an enormously disruptive impact on relationships in the region and has raised serious doubts about directions. And that movement, whether it's Tunisia or Libya or Egypt, is still very much uh, uh, up for grabs. I did just come back from Egypt on the weekend. Uh, I met with the the military council, I met with uh, the prime minister, the, the temporary you know, government, and met with the Brotherhood, and I met with the Freedom Party and other civilians at large, and came away convinced of this, that uh, nobody is doing enough to help this outcome be what it should be. And in fact, some are making mischief. And it is imperative that the global community recognized that Egypt is a quarter of the Arab world. And it is spared the great divide of Shia and Sunni, but nevertheless has this challenge of the Brotherhood and the Salafists, who were surprisingly strong in the election. And unless there is an economic commitment, the economic vision, uh, I don't know how any government is going to solve this problem. Uh, they need to move to the IMF uh, negotiation, and I urge that. They need to come to an IMF agreement, but they also need to find the global community prepared to bring investment back. They have to deal with security in the streets as rapidly as they can in order to bring tourism back, uh, and they desperately need to guarantee rights, the rights of minorities, the rights of uh, speech, the rights of assembly, all of those rights that are going to be so critical to their constitutional process. I will say that what was encouraging to me was the fact that uh, uh, the Brotherhood at least is saying the right things and is expressing their desire to embrace all of those uh, rights and uh, recognize the reality of the marketplace and to move in the right direction. The proof will be in the pudding. The test will not be in words but in actions. But it is far better to start off with them uh, espousing those principles and begin to work in that way towards that. How we do that will depend on how effectively we put the Brent Scowcroft principles to practice, build a bipartisan consensus in our own country, and manage a transition. And so all of those three transitions I just talked about can benefit enormously from what you all are engaged in here. And I thank you very much. I understand that uh, 
Fred wants me to take a few questions, but I, 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 I think I've won my bet. I bet Mitt Romney $10,000 I would end in under 10, 15 minutes on here. Anyway. <laughs> um, let me quote you back to you. You are celebrating a methodology, a way of being a certain stature, a way of listening to each other more effectively, finding community of interest that allows us to get something done. Uh, what a wonderful way to start this day. In some ways, you take us back to the founding moment because Senator Kerry, a Democrat now, uh, at 4.30 will have four national security advisors, two who have served de Democratic presidents, uh, General Jones and, and, and Big Brzezinski, two who have uh, supported Republican presidents, Kissinger and Scowcroft, talking about where the world is going. And then tonight, a Republican, uh, uh, Bob Gates, talking about the future uh, and, and toasting, and I hope roasting General Skoko. <laughs> uh, um, uh, le let me just ask one thing and then uh, open up. My, my question is, uh, what kind of a model are we right now to the Middle East and North Africa and its transitions, and is that a problem? You're talking about uh, a polarized situation here. We see the Eurozone uh, with uh, uh, perhaps the most dramatic problems Europe has faced since uh, since the creation of the coal and steel community. How big of a role does this play in a transition in the Middle East and, and North Africa? Uh, a serious role. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a problem. And I've talked to Secretary Clinton about it. She and I have both agreed that in our meetings with leaders in other countries, they're looking at us more skeptically. And when we say something to them, in many cases, it may not have very much meaning. And it's very hard to sit there and say, you ought to do it this way. We're not able to do it this way. And I'll tell you, I tried this so hard uh, with my colleagues on the super committee. Um, and I hate to say it. I don't want to sound a partisan note, and I'm not saying this in a partisan way, but I have to tell you folks, there was just a pure political calculation in what happened here. And, and, and for whatever reason, that the Republican Party has been transformed into a party that, it, that's base is so intense about this tax issue, characterized significantly by Grover Norquist and the pledge and all of that, that it's frozen, locked into place. I mean, look at every presidential candidate. And I think it's going to be very, very difficult to offer the kind of visionary program the nation needs when you're locked into that uh, position personally. Uh, but it makes it exceedingly hard for us to do the things we need to do. And I tried to argue with my colleagues. All of them said, oh, my God, you know, this is a great moment for us. We've got to, you know, come to agreement. We, we need to send a message to the world. The United States has its act together. And above all, folks, we could have made ourselves the financial haven of the planet. Had we made that decision, think of the role of investment that would it would save money in America. Uh, and the only thing that saves us is that the $1.2 trillion is an automatic cut that takes place next year, so the markets are discounting to some degree and figuring something will happen. But the calculation was this, that there were people who believed their party is going to win the presidency and the Senate, and then they'll do everything they want in their own bill on reconciliation and Katie bar the door. That's a hell of a bet to take. And the second part of it was the pledge and the fear of the Tea Party and people and being primaried and the amount of money you have to raise in American politics today to survive. And people were restrained by that. So I think it has a profound impact. And we, we need to get our act together. Now, there's nothing like an election to concentrate the mind of people in public life and elected public life. And I think this will be the centerpiece of the election. And I'd rather far rather, far rather have President Barack Obama's hand to play in that than theirs. And I believe the President has found his footing on it. I think he's in, you know, increasingly sounding uh, uh, the clarity of uh, where America is. Overwhelmingly, 68, 70 percent of America knows we have to have some revenue to solve this problem. Also, we need to do entitlements. We understand that. But let me be clear to all of you. We put every sacred cow of entitlements on the table. And I can prove it in paper, actual written proposals, means testing, copay, uh, you know, uh, reduct, I mean, uh, stuff that I had 3,000 people demonstrating outside my office in Boston. 
Not one of them ever had anybody demonstrate against them because they never put anything on the table that took that until Toomey put the 350 billion. When Toomey did that in the end, I offered them to take that deal. We said, we'll take your 350. Just delay the Bush tax cut until the election and let the tax committees have an expedited procedure. Expedited procedure. We'll give you that next December with a 34% rate on individual tax and a 25% rate on corporate tax and we'll deal with territoriality and American business can take off and will be competitive across the world. Guaranteed vote next December, expedited procedure, 25%, 34%. We turned it down because we didn't make the Bush tax cuts permanent. So that's where we're stuck, and I'll take that hand out to the country any day. I tend to, between now and next November. The, um, thank you, Senator Kerry. We've, got, we've just got a few minutes left. Maybe I'll just scoop up one or two questions. Um, and also, please start eating, or the hotel organizers of this will really uh, start getting terribly nervous, please. I have a question that most of you and your colleagues hate to answer because it requires a one-word answer. Um, I would ask this, China, friend, or foe? And you can't go in between. <laughs> well, I'm not going to do that. Uh, <laughs> because it's not a foe, and it's not yet fully the friend that we want it to be, it, it's sort of in between. And that's just a reality. Uh, on, uh, I, I, I think the worst thing we could do is make it a foe. And if you, if you move in the wrong way on that, uh, that could happen. I, I, I don't want, uh, in my judgment, they are a complicated partner in a number of efforts uh, and uh, adversaries on some other interests, but not a foe. And I think the last thing we want to do is make them one. Um, I, I, I know we've promised you to get out of here at a sharp time, so let me end, end with the transatlantic question. How concerned are you as you look at the Eurozone uh, crises, uh, as you look at the solutions that are being put forward by Germany and others, uh, and, and how does that affect the way you look at the transatlantic community's role in our global future? Well, the tra obviously, the Euro community is critical to our economy, critical to us in so many different ways. Uh, it is the number one purchasing power in the world. Number one, ahead of China, Japan, the United States, and China. Uh, and and uh, clearly, uh, we need to pay attention to that. I am very, very concerned about it. I think the marketplace today, you see, is not uh, buying into this notion of the treaty changes as sufficient because uh, it's undelivered and in some cases may be undeliverable. And so quickly the focus has already turned to Italy and Spain. Uh, and what can they really do to meet the debt? And they need about 300 billion uh, euros or plus in the next few months uh, in debt float. That's going to be the real test here, folks, as much as anything. Uh, I think it is exceedingly difficult, and this has always been the complication of this arrangement, and, and, and Britain has understood it uh, from the beginning, obviously, as have some other countries in Europe who never joined up. I mean, you look at the Swiss franc today and you see where it is and why it is, and it's because of this fundamental confrontation with the fiscal realities of some of these countries and their historical and cultural uh, facts with respect to how their economies work and how, what the relationship is with government. If that doesn't profoundly change in some of those countries, I don't know how you make it work. I, I, I'd love it to work, I just don't know how you make it work without the central bank ability and without a common fiscal set of rules. So I think, you know, we've all read that perhaps Angela Merkel has a strategy here. Perhaps she's working everybody to the point where they do come on board at the last minute to something that isn't marketable today politically, perhaps, I say. But to do what they need to do would probably cost each German citizen about 80,000 euro. And they're not prepared to do that. So anybody's question mark, but I think we all need to be deeply, deeply concerned about it and it will affect America in profound ways uh, on our economy as well as on other interests that we have. Thank you again, Brent. Thank you. Salute you, my friend, and congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.